So I get all the, asked all the time, what makes Kadena better than other blockchains? What makes Kadena so special? Why is everybody not talking about Kadena? Once you start to study Kadena's technology and you realize what Kadena actually is and how powerful this smart contract language is going to be and what it's going to do for the space as far as making things safe, secure, a coding language that audits itself instantly and can analyze a bazillion outcomes in a matter of a second, in fractions of a second, and come back and analyze your code that you just wrote about your blockchain and give you any area where the code could be flawed, where there could be a bug or an error, that unless you manually go and test out a billion different scenarios with Ethereum, you're just never gonna know, right? And that's why so many hacks happen in Ethereum. Think about this industry, right? Blockchain's supposed to make things safe, secure, transparent, but yet every day the hacks get bigger and bigger. People are losing more and more money. More and more applications are breaking. They can't scale. They can't work. We've seen the industry try to come out with some great idea. Titty twister roll-ups, moped compression algorithms, Johnny Dow's pizza oven, where if you stake 37 salami nipples, you get a freaking Martha Stewart little cookie cooker. I don't know, guys. It just seems so goofy to me. Why wouldn't you want to code in a language that's human readable, that audits itself, and that has formal verification. Ready? Let's dive deep. So in this first video, I'm gonna play a quick clip of what is formal verification to get you guys like an idea of what formal verification means. And then we're gonna watch one more clip after that that'll really explain it and you can actually see the code auditing itself. This is a video by Gallus, G-A-L-O-I-S on YouTube. Swing down in the description. After this video is finished, you'll find a link. Software. It runs our world, becoming more sophisticated and infinitely complex. From our cell phones, to our cars, to our medical devices, we trust our sensitive information, even our lives, to a complicated maze of algorithms. Where safety and security are critical, the repercussions of insecure systems can be catastrophic. Even with rigorous testing, there are countless ways for things to go wrong. So how can we make these systems safe? By going back to first principles and mathematically proving that software is correct. Just like a builder who relies on a blueprint for construction, programmers rely on a critical system specifications outlining how it should and should not perform. These specifications are translated into coded instructions. But often, the specification and code do not match up. This causes flaws that lead to breakdowns, malfunctions, or cyber attacks. With formal verification, we can analyze deep properties of the code to prove nothing is lost in translation and that the software does only what it's intended to do. We do this by converting both the code and the specification into mathematical representations, which are then checked against each other by mathematical proof. If they do not align, we isolate the cause of the mismatch and correct it. Imagine an elaborate maze. Now multiply it by billions. The number of possible routes through the complicated maze of modern software is larger than the number of atoms in our solar system. With conventional testing, it would take thousands of years to test each path individually for flaws. Therefore, critical routes are often missed. Formal verification allows us to evaluate all possible scenarios and the entire state space all at once. As a result, we eliminate entire classes of flaws, dramatically improving the safety and security of our critical systems and greatly reducing costs down the road. These days, we trust our most critical systems in ways they don't deserve. By formally verifying both their design and implementation, we can prove correctness in systems where failure is unacceptable. You guys get what he was saying here with this maze, right? So when he was showing you this maze here, if you wanted a computer basically or a human to go through and figure out what is the fastest way to basically get through this maze, you have to know every area where you fail, every area you can't go. In order to map that out and find out statistically the best strategy, you'd have to be able to analyze all outcomes. And Microsoft created something called Z3 or Z3. And it's basically a software that can do things like that. Kadena built packed with human readable code. So this guy's gonna, this video is like six minutes. He's, we're actually gonna watch him explain how formal verification works. It's really sick. And how you can use that when coding 
I will watch both one and two because they're both really good. We're using a library wrapper called PySMT, which by default uses the open source solver called Z3. And we're setting up our problem by saying we want to have a group of letters made by the set of hello and world. And hello is every letter um, in the word hello and world is every letter in the word world. And then our problem space here is we're telling the solver it's got to find a, a value for each of the letters that has to be greater or equal to one, less than 10 for all those letters, that all of the letters, the assignments have to be different. And that when you add all the letters up that make up the word hello, they've got to equal the same sum as all the letters added up in the word world. Then we print out the serialization of the formula. And then if we do get a result, we'll print that out. Otherwise, we print no solution found. So let's see how that works. So you can see the serialization of the formula here. And this first part is making sure that each of the letter symbols is getting more than or equal to 1 and less than 10. So that takes us all the way to here. And then this second part is saying that each of the letter assignments has to be different to each other. And that takes us all the way to here. And additionally, that the sum of all those letters has to equal the sum of all those letters. And it's come up with a solution with these uh, integer assignments to these symbols that satisfies our problem. And so the uh, solver is satisfied, so uh, we get the result. So do you guys get that? He took the word hello and the word world, and he wrote a line of code and he says, hey guys, I want this software to actually find, find a solution on how I can assign one letter with one number I can't, this like E couldn't be eight and D couldn't be eight, right? You had to use a different letter for, you had to use a different number for each letter and you had to use numbers one through 10. You couldn't go above 10. So he, next he's gonna show you where a bug would be. Solution is found. If we change this so that it can, uh, can only assign more than or equal to one and less than five, by inspection, we can see this can never work because we've got, we've also saying that all the values have to be different and we've got more than um, five. We've got more than four letters in both hello and world. So if we now run this, we get no solution found. And this is an interesting point with formal verification. When the solvers work, they give you a true or a false answer. There's no gray area. There's no possible solution waiting if only it waited a bit longer or it had looked in a different place. It's either it's found something or it's not found it. And that's called exhaustive. So why this language that we call PACT? That's the name of the language we wrote. Our ideas about what a safer language is is one that it's interpreted. Uh, that means that, you know, at any point in time when you're talking about what code is going to execute, it's the code you wrote. It's not some lowered version of it. Um, it's safer also in this idea that we got from Bitcoin of that it's good to have something that's Turing complete that will always terminate. It's simpler in that it really just tries to do database and authorization and a few other things. It's safer in the sense that it doesn't allow you to reassign variables. Lastly, it's easier in the sense that once you write code in this, you get an API out of it. For free. One of the things I'm trying to talk about here is that we built all this in Haskell, and Haskell is this amazing language for writing languages. That's why I'm trying to get into really the motivations and the design of this so that I can empower all of you to think about how you're going to use Haskell or OCaml or any of these languages to write languages that don't necessarily look like Haskell or OCaml. And why would you want to do that? So what was interesting about that experience is that we were writing a type checker that wasn't for the runtime environment. We were writing a type checker kind of just to have a type checker and also to, for this one particular path in the tool chain. We're using this SMT lib compiling uh, library. I should have put that in the library list. I don't know why I didn't do that. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, the reason why we're able to do this is that we're already a form of single assignment semantics or, or you know, SSA. Uh, we have no recursion. Um, our code is all, once you load something into our uh, environment, it already gets inlined, which is one of the things you have to do. Since we, don't ha since we have no recursion, that's easy to do. And so we built this type checker to output a typed AST, and that made it possible for us to start using, um, this is a little hard to see on the monitors, but basically if you take like a typical Bitcoin function, it doesn't turn into much more uh, SMT lib2 than this. Yeah, I mean, there's more, but, 
but it's just interesting since SMT lib it, uh, is a Lisp itself. You know, there is, it was just kind of fun to see that we could actually do this in a, in a reasonable amount of time. But one of the problems you run into when you start talking about formal verification is that we want to get formal verification to the masses. We want people to actually be using formal verification to make their code better. And, and that's, a t that's a tall order because most people don't understand what formal verification is. Uh, you know, it's just a very hard concept to understand. So remember what I said is that we don't, we don't have an immutable language because we have this huge global variable called the database. So what we decided was let's make a little DSL within PACT uh, doing a kind of doc test Python-esque thing where you put something in the, co in the comment to uh, declare what you want to prove. And let's give you two, uh, let's give you range stability and let's give you mass conservation, which is basically a net zero kind of thing. We want to say that, uh, you know, this is an important thing in, you know, kind of actuarial land, which is you want to say that anytime you take money out of the system, you put money back into the system. We're, we're calling that mass conservation. So let's look at how this works. We have a function here. We have a module. So packed everything is in modules. That's how you define a service. It goes on the blockchain. You've got this nice service. So maybe we have this account service. And, but here we're just calling an analyze test as the module. And we have a function called pay. And in the pay, we're basically saying that we're going to prove that the balance column conserves mass and that it never goes below zero. That's, you know, that's a very tangible thing that would be very nice to be able to say about your database because it's like, you know, we're trying to keep track of money here. We want to make sure that we never double spend. And in this case, we don't want overdrafts. We don't, we don't want to, so we want to make sure that the balance column is always greater than zero. Of course, there isn't that much code, right? This is a really, really simple function. So duh, I mean, you know, there's no bugs here. We have read. We have read. We have enforce sufficient funds. We have write. We have write. I can look at this code, and I'm like, looks pretty good, right? But whatever, proving is cool. So we're going to prove some stuff, right? So here we go. So first, what we do is we do the compiler. So the compiler spits out SMT lib. So it's going to capture every variable in there. I mean, this is another thing where Lisp is great, because you know, Lisp just makes scoping as freaking obvious as it could possibly be. You know? So it's really just like, and, you know, and by the way, we really are a Lisp. We have let, we have let star, with the whole confusion about whether to use let and let star. Um, we have a, <laughs> We have way too many parentheses. It's, it's, it's a real lisp. Um, so anyway, so we're going to declare all this stuff. And this is where the money part starts, right? So, what, what, so we're using Z3. Z3 got open sourced by Microsoft about two years ago. It's blazingly fast, but it's relatively new on the scene because it was closed source. So people weren't using it in academia and stuff like that. But it's freaking amazing. I mean, what it can do in a very short period of time is it can basically uh, it can basically simulate the entire universe of inputs um, and then try to break something for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to make assertions that we want it to prove false. So we're going to assert, in the case of uh, conserves mass, we're going to take everything that represents a write to the database, and we're going to take everything that represents a read from the database, and we're going to add those, and we're going to try to say that they always have to be equal. And that's just a way to formulate mass conservation as a math problem. And we put not in front of it so that we say, Z3, tell us if this is ever possible that we could write the wrong thing to the database. Same thing with the uh, range. We're going to basically do an assertion of an or that any of these things that end up being update, updates to the database are ever, uh, are, we say greater than or equal to zero, and then we put not in front of it. And again, we're going to call check sat, we're going to call check sat, and we're going to have Z3 ruin our day. So here we go. But remember, that code was great, right? We looked at it. It was awesome. It, it had no bugs. So here we go. So the first one, we can serve mass. We know how to write code. It was great. Unsat. Yay. <laughs> Second one, sat. And in fact, this happened with this, because this was a code that we, it was in our open source repository. We're like, Z3 sucks, or we can't write SMT lib. There's got to be a problem. No, our code sucks, actually. <laughs> Amount. All you have to do is pass an amount of negative one, and it's broken. It's a bug. It found a bug. Now, what's interesting about Z3 is Z3 doesn't give you the range of all possibilities. It's not a prover in that respect. It's not going to like show you all the ways you're fucked. Excuse me. <laughs> Screwed. Um, it's going to show you exactly one way. It's going to give you a model. It's going to give you a model that says, here's how things aren't good. right? So negative one, well, 
what does that tell us? It tells us that we left an invariant out of here. So again, we have this thing called enforce. So let's go in and let's make sure that our amount is greater than zero. It's a bunch of loosey-goosey stuff in Pact. Like we'll do like coercions and stuff like that because you know that's what C programmers are used to. So and then we're going to say something like amount greater than zero or amount less than zero or whatever. Who cares? Isn't it? By the way, this makes us better than Ethereum, the fact that we have error messages. <laughs> All right, so are we in? Okay, so now we just make sure it compiles. We just put in that little fix. It looks like it compiles. So then we're going to pass that into ZM3S3. Unsat and sat. So I just want to point out, yeah, I mean, It's an amazing tool. I mean, it's really one of these things that like, and this is something that we're working on actively to try to like make this DSL really big and obviously make it work over an entire corpus of functions. So anyways, I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just questions or is that it? But yeah, guys, that's a wrap. I got to run. I appreciate you guys big time. Thank you guys so much for stopping by the channel. Catch you guys next one. Peace.